Welcome everybody to the beautiful Godwin Turnbach Museum. We love hosting our events here. I'm Jason Tuga, and I am here in my new capacity as director of the MFA program in creative writing and literary translation here at Queens College. So it's exciting to host this event, Creative Nonfiction Now. Uh, for those of you here in person, I really encourage you to check out the art. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, it's called The African Crucifixion, and it's made by seven different South African artists. And each panel is made by a different artist. Five of them um, have portraits on the wall back there that you can check out, but it's just stunning beadwork. Um, so during the reception, I, I encourage you to wander around and look. Um, Okay, so tonight we are very excited to welcome Karina Del Valle Shorsky, Bridgette Davis, and Cutter Wood, and I'm going to allow our moderator, Francesca Hyatt, to tell you a little bit more about them in a minute. But I just want to thank the Godwin Turbach Museum and especially Stephanie Lee, who, had, who is here so we can be here physically. Um, but also Louise Weinberg and Maria Pio, who are very gracious in opening up this room to us. Uh, I want to I thank Brie Allen Hopper, who helped me organize this event, uh, one of our MFA faculty and assistant director of the program. And a huge thanks to John Rice, who's coming in the door, for all his help putting this together. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about Francesca. First of all, she's an alum of our program and now faculty in our department. So it's just fantastic for us, we're so pleased. Um, Francesca is a writer, translator, and lecturer of English at CUNY Queens College. She has an MFA in creative nonfiction and her chapbook, Forest Wish, won the Birdhouse Prize in 2022, is published by Ghost Bird Press. She's an editor at KTB Magazine and founding co-editor of the new literary journal, Clotheslines. Uh, she's also co-editor of forthcoming, the forthcoming anthology, Eating Alone, and you can find out more about her at francescahyatt.com. All right, so Francesca is having some cold symptoms, so she had to stay home today, um, and she's going to moderate virtually, and we're going to have this experiment. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Jason, for that introduction. Um, I'm so glad that everybody's here. I'm really excited for the conversation tonight and to hear each of your the author's work. Um, and just thank you, everyone, for your flexibility with this more unusual moderation um, format. So hopefully it goes well. But as Jason said, it's an experiment. Um, but yeah, I'm so I'm so pleased. I'm so pleased to be here. I'm going to introduce each author and then um, each one will read in turn and then we'll have a conversation and we'll have plenty of time for Q&A um, and then there will be a reception. So I'm going to start with Karina. Um, so Karina Del Valle Shorsky is a writer and translator of Puerto Rican literature. Her essays and criticism have been published in many venues, um, including The Believer, Book Forum and the New York Times Magazine, where she is a contributing writer. In 2022, she won a National Magazine Award for her cover story on social dancing in times of crisis. She holds a PhD in comparative literature from Columbia University, and her debut essay collection, The Other Island, was honored with a Whiting Nonfiction Grant in 2020 and is forthcoming from Riverhead Books. And, and we have Bridgette M. Davis, is the author of the memoir, The World According to Fanny Davis, My Mother's Life in the Detroit Numbers, which is a New York Times editor's choice, a 2020 magazine notable book award, and was named a best book of 2019 by Kirkus Reviews, BuzzFeed, NBC News, and Parade Magazine, and most recently was featured as a clue on the quiz show Jeopardy. She recently wrote the screenplay for the film adaptation, which will be produced by Plan B Entertainment and released by Searchlight Pictures. She's currently writing a new, memo new memoir, Love Rita, to be published by Harper Books in spring 2025. She's the author of two novels, Into the Go Slow and Shifting Through Neutral. Davis is Professor Emerita at Baruch College and the CUNY Graduate Center. And then Cutter Wood is the author of Love and Death in the Sunshine State and the forthcoming Earthly Materials, Journeys Through Our Bodies Emissions, Excretions, and Disintegrations. His work has appeared in Harper's, the Virginia Quarterly Review, the Paris Review Daily, and other publications. 
He is the recipient of fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Breadloaf Writers Conference, and he was the Jean, uh, Jenny McKean Moore Writer in Residence at George Washington University. Please join me in welcoming our authors. Thank you so much for being here. Um, wonderful. And so I think um, I think we can just go in the order that I just read your bios, if that's okay. Um, Karina, can you start us out? Such a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you so much for inviting me, Jason and Briallen and Queens College. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm going to read a little excerpt from a chapter of my book, The Other Island. Um, it's a chapter that's much longer. I rarely write 10 minute long <laughs> works of art, but um, I'll read uh, 10 minutes from the big beginning of this chapter. That's about um, the kind of history of Puerto Rican backup dancers in New York City. When I fell for the video girl in Omarion's touch, I never thought I'd come to know her name. I loved her for her low-slung baggy jeans and spangled bustier. I loved her for the wave arranged across her forehead, her sly smile, and most of all, of course, for the way she danced. In the video, Omarion spots her with her girls as she's leaving the club, and soon they involve each other in a pedestrian duet that elaborates the walk home along the lines of a Cuban rumba. Frankly sexual, magnetically relational, but rarely, barely touching. What won my attention was an unusual liberty in her movement. Unconfined, it seemed, by a tightly choreographed routine or proper place in the staged urban environment, and a looseness in her waistline I can't help calling Spanish. In Latin music, lyrics linger less over hips and ass, lavishing attention instead on la cintura atomica, la cintura sueltecita, as the locus of sensual movement, maybe even the primary engine of Latin cultures multiple successive explosions. Marking the waist as specifically Spanish doesn't really check out in a diasporic vocabulary that includes whining, belly dance, even hula. But that's how I responded to her body, with recognition. I followed the current that ran up and down her torso, briefly electrifying each gesture as if it were a spoken phrase that would resolve into a statement. I wanted to know where the meaning would land. I didn't expect to see this dancer again. Maybe I couldn't see past the way she'd been cast, as a girl who appears suddenly in the chaos of the club, then slips back a moment, an hour, a day later, into the city's unsyncopated working rhythm. Blink. Touch. This was 2005, before the internet's full power was at my fingertips, before I could feel confident that the phrase Omarion Video Girl would yield a name, a resume, a world. I didn't try. For years, I'd returned to her on YouTube, exhibiting her to friends and lovers, an avatar of an erotic freedom, improvisational play, anonymous genius, I wanted her to be noticed beyond the terms the screen had set, and I wanted to be noticed for noticing her. Pop culture teaches us that backup dancers are beneath notice. They're not real artists, and the pleasure we take in them is primitive. They are not suitable emissaries of culture, even if culture wouldn't be any fun without them. There are no prominent prizes for video girls, no credit roll at the end of concerts naming names. When we pick favorites and mimic their moves, our mothers make sure we know not to aspire. Backup dancing is not aspirational. It's a no man's land where brown girls are liable to languish, underpaid and overworked. It's one wrong turn away from sex work. When Cardi B brags, I don't dance now, I make money moves. She's minimizing the difference between the kind of dancing she used to do on the pole and the kind of dancing done on other stages. Neither one, she seems to say, will pay. These messages have posed a problem for me because I grew up in a time and place in which every Puerto Rican you'd ever heard of was or had been a backup dancer. The distinction between was and had been didn't matter that much 
because the fact that certain individuals had achieved star status did little to reduce the stigma of salacious amateurism that lingered with them. Especially before Lin-Manuel Miranda, Sonia Sotomayor, and Ale Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez went to Washington, the prototypical Puerto Rican in US consciousness was dancing girl emoji, skin tone tan. Probably she still is. As a dweeby tween, I wasn't ashamed. I liked being noticed in relation to something sexy. But I see now why my mother was. There's an implied analogy between the backup dancer and Puerto Rico itself, as if the island exists first and foremost for the empire's entertainment, as if Puerto Ricans can't be, can be famous too, so long as we know our precarious, paradoxical place. Official policy refers to Puerto Rico as a commonwealth, but it's really a shadow colony in plain view, hyper visible, especially in relation to the colonies most Americans don't know or name, Guam, American Samoa, the US Virgin Islands. The United States government sometimes refers to Puerto Rico as the shining star of the Caribbean, a phrase dreamed up for a mid-century publicity campaign designed to attract business investment to the island. But this special status has not protected Puerto Rico or its diaspora from myriad forms of colonial extraction. Puerto Rico is both empire's shining star and in the notorious words of US Senator Bate, a heterogeneous mass of mongrels, threatening the nation's delicate racial and political ecosystem from the shadowy margins. There are too many of us, mass, and each of one of us already contains too many, mongrel. When changes in US economic priorities have displaced Puerto Ricans from Puerto Rico itself, we've become backup bodies in cities like New York, Chicago, and Philadelphia. By the late 20th century, Puerto Ricans made up the largest immigrant group in New York. Life hasn't been much better stateside, but there is still an important sense in which the Puerto Rican pseudo-citizen moves Dike freely in relation to her cousins in the rest of the Caribbean and Latin America. She won't be deported exactly. Instead, she'll spin in a perpetual motion machine. All of these myths and policies converge on the body of the Puerto Rican backup dancer. The consolation prize for second-class citizenship, really for lack of sovereignty, has been cultural nationalism. We can shimmy and shake all we like, get loud and proud about how well we do it. But even when the backup dancer gets to be a star, she's on the blink, appearing and disappearing like the bright spot on the nocturnal satellite map before and after Hurricane Maria. Over the years, there are certain stars I've come to count on that seem to have achieved a steady glow. Rita Moreno, for example, Rosie Perez, Jennifer Lopez. Invoking them in sequence like this suggests a progressive history, a lineage in which I secretly attempt to situate myself. But the more I read into it, the less it feels like history and the more it feels like a cut-rate carousel. I'm stuck on the constant costume changes these women have hustled through to appear against the backup dancers' odds as names we know. Despite the individuality that stardom confers, they've passed through many of the same institutions and come to many of the same professional crossroads. Sometimes they have literally danced in each other's footsteps or played the same roles. They stand out from and stand in for New York City itself, Nueva York, Los Neores, a few recognizable forms in what the performance scholar Jana Brown calls the multi-jointed body of the female tableau. She's talking about black vaudevillians at the turn of the 20th century, but the image translates. There's a complex pleasure to getting lost in the crowd. Brown goes on to quote a contemporary of Josephine Baker's. She was just a chorus girl baby. We all was chorus girls. But it's hard to hear her tone. Is the chorus girl jaded, disabusing, disabusing us of the glamour we associate with the star, implying that she can never really rise above her station? Or is taking the star, star down a peg a way to hold her close, to include her in movements we, movements all? Growing up, I wanted to be included, even especially in the mass of mongrels. 
I knew Senator Bate didn't mean to make it seem like so much fun, at least not on the face of it. But by the time we get around to the 1978 Rolling Stones song, Miss You, Mick Jagger is sure the way to sound American on R&B radio, the way to sound black, is to growl, we're gonna come around here at 12 with some Puerto Rican girls who's just dying to meet you. I liked singing along, accustomed like the women of all backgrounds to extracting pleasure and power from pop music's misogyny. Sometimes I still do. Maybe I was particularly vulnerable to crude seductions because our family was the opposite of a crowd, me and my mother in California, my grandmother in New York, no siblings, no husbands. Until I left the Bay Area for New York when I was 18, my direct relatives were really the only Puerto Ricans I knew. I was grateful for my Chicano friends at the private schools we attended on scholarship. We began our political lives together, but culturally speaking, they didn't really know where to place me, and I wasn't in a position to help them. If Jennifer Lopez implied an urban world teeming with around-the-way girls and spontaneous block parties, I was eager to be implicated. In Zami, Audre Lorde's erotic memoir, she articulates her mother's longing for her natal island of Grenada. She missed the music you didn't have to listen to because it was always around. When my mother danced around the apartment, it became populous with stories of her father's famous footwork, Motown madness with her college boyfriend, Jose, the live drums from, from the New Rican village that seemed to fall in line behind her heels. We'd angle out the closet door with the full length mirror so she could teach me her teenage moves, the mashed potato, the Watusi, the jerk. And then she'd spin out where I couldn't follow, spurred into a frenzy by the telltale cowbell in Adoración. She was multiplied at both ends by everything that entered her and everything her dancing made me do, the movement she started in our living room, a culture of one. Given our isolation, it would take me years of living in New York to discern whether my mother's, which of my mother's gestures and behaviors were the product of her powerful personality and which were Puerto Rican cultural commonplaces. It isn't always easy or explanatory to name the difference. In her memoir, Rita Moreno remembers moving to Washington Heights and sitting on the wrought iron grill base beside an open window while our new radio, shaped like a small cathedral, blared music. With neighbor girls, she put on costumes and spun through living rooms and even entertained on the rooftop. Rosie Perez credits her early dance training to the long summers she spent with her cousin Cookie in a dilapidated tenement that she kept clean as hell, doing the hustle in the kitchen while my wet set dried. I wonder if we'd call it training if we never came to see her dance on TV. Was I training too, for the pedestrian life I have, in which I am only famous for my dancing among the friends who follow my Instagram stories? for my gracelessly improvised life as a writer. The New York I live in now is more densely Caribbean than it was when Audre Lorde's mother suffered the unmusical noise of the North. Despite the city's constant war on public space, the air, the air at least stays thick, stays wavy. These days, the uptown bodegas play bachata, and when I walk by, I like to let it inflect the rhythm of my walking, the music I don't have to listen to because it's everywhere, the dance I don't have to do because it's always in my body. It's a trope of black diasporic dance to start small, as if walking, as if merely shifting weight, hitching a skirt. The better to dramatize the smooth continuum between everyday life and the high fever of the mess around. My mother sometimes worries about the way I walk, especially in Washington Heights, where my grandmother lives. She migrated pregnant with my mother 15 years after Rita Moreno. In that great migration, as we taking a cue as we often do from African American history's great migration from the rural South to the urban North. I still visit my grandmother in the same neighborhood, the same building where my mother grew up. And yet it isn't the same. I was born post-crack and post-Reagan, so our block has always been that kind of hood to me. Now it's gentrifying. 
I admit wishing we could keep the ancestral apartments somehow so I could live there with rent control. But she doesn't think I understand the danger. Around here, Latinas are always the ones hit hardest by street violence, she says. I don't know whether I am, in this case, her daughter or the daughter of my gringo father. So I ask. She thinks the corner boys can tell I'm Latin like them. You can't do anything about the way you move. In the heat of conflict, I feel a pleasurable frisson, the transmission alive in me. I wouldn't wish that way out of my body because I wouldn't wish my body away. It feels safer somehow to stay close to my mother even when she says it isn't. I know that standing out can pose its own dangers depending on how and among whom. Cue Zora Neale Hurston, I feel most colored when I'm thrown against a stark white background. The image evokes the police precinct's mugshot as vivid, vividly as the, gallery muse, as the museum gallery's wall. I also know that being singular, or at least the idea of being singular, has mattered to both my grandmother and my mother because it's mattered to their survival. Moving out, away, up from poverty is often easier alone, disassociated from the trope of the hungry horde but even loneliness has a lineage, and I find myself feeling for it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karina. That was, that was fantastic, thank you. Um, why don't we have Bridget come up next? I feel so old school with a book. <laughs> Um, so I just want to uh, thank Jason and everyone who made this possible for us to be here. It's really a pleasure. It's my first time on Queens College campus, so it's a great first experience. It's really nice to be here. Um, so I'm going to read from my memoir, The World According to Fanny Davis is the story of my mom and her very unorthodox profession, um, which enabled us to have a middle class life. So I'll just start from the beginning, so there's no setup, and just go from there. On a morning like most, I sit beside Mama at the dining room table, eating my bowl of sugar-frosted flakes and watching her work. She's on the telephone, its receiver in the crook of her neck as she records her customers' three-digit bets in a spiral notebook, repeating each one. The crystal chandelier blazes above. Five, four, two, four, quarter? Six, nine, three, straight for 50 cents. Is this both races, Miss Queenie? Detroit and Pontiac? Okay. Three, eight, eight, straight for a quarter? Uh-huh. Four, seven, five, straight for 50 cents. One, ten, box for a dollar. Mama, writes the numbers 110, draws a box around them, hesitates, you know. I got customers been playing 110 all week. Yeah, it's a fancy number. Oh, did you? What did you dream? He was a hunchback? Is that what the Red Devil dream books say it play for? Now that I didn't know. I know theater plays for 110. Well, I can take it for a dollar. But since it's a fancy, I can't take it for more than that. You understand. What else, Miss Queenie? 684 for 50 cents boxed? Uh-huh. 972 straight for a dollar? I find comfort in Mama's voice, in the familiar rhythmic recitation of numbers. I bring the bowl to my lips and drink the last of the sweetened milk before I rise and kiss Mama's forehead. She mouths bye-bye as I join my sister Rita, who's waiting on the porch. Together, we walk three long blocks to Winter Halter Elementary and Junior High School, passing by the lush Russell Woods Park. I am a first grader. In class, I wait in line to show my teacher, Miss Miller, my assignment. 
We have had to color paper petals, cut them out, and paste them onto a picture of a flower. I like mine, as I've glued each one just at the base, so that the petals now reach out into a pop-up flower. Ms. Miller looks over my work, gives it one star instead of two, and stops me before I can return to my seat. You sure do have a lot of shoes, she says. Last week, she asked what my father did for a living. And because I knew never to disclose the family business, I said, he doesn't work. <laughs> she asked, well, what does your mother do? I froze. I'm not sure I lied. I knew my mother was in the numbers, but I also knew not to tell that to anyone. I worried that my vague answer was the wrong one, but I didn't know a better response because no one had told me what I should say. Now, with Miss Miller staring at me, I look down at my feet, which are clad in, I still remember, light blue patent leather slip-ons with lace-trimmed buckles, a favorite pair bought to match a brocade ensemble I have just worn for Easter. I nod, not knowing what else to do. Before you sit down, I want you to name every pair of shoes you have, she insists. Go ahead. There's no lightness in her voice. Anxious, I go through a mental inventory of the shoes that line the built-in rack in my bedroom closet. I manage to recall 10 pairs in various colors and styles. The black and white polka dotted ones with the bow tie, the buckled ruby red ones, the salmon pink lace-ups. 10 pairs is an awful lot, says Miss Miller. Her blue eyes fix on me with something that I cannot name, but which I would now call disdain. And she orders me to take my seat. I can feel my classmates staring at me as I return to my table. Is it wrong to have so many pairs of shoes? Did my mother get them in a bad way? The next day in class, Miss Miller calls me back to her desk. I can smell the hairspray in her teased blonde bouffant. You didn't mention you had white shoes, she snaps. Indeed, I'm wearing a white version of the same pair I wore the previous day. I feel as though I've been caught in a lie, and I know that I've disappointed my teacher. I worry that I'll get in trouble at school or worse at home. I'm sorry, I whisper. Miss Miller shakes her head in disgust and dismisses me with a wave of her hand. I return to my desk, trying hard not to look down at my shoes. I'm ashamed of them. That evening, I tell Mama what happened, but I wait until after she's finished taking her customers' bets and before the day's winning numbers come out. I've already learned that the best time to tell mama difficult news, something that could get you in trouble, is during that brief expectant pause in the day. That's when mama's least distracted and still in a good mood. She listens, and when I confess I forgot to tell Miss Miller about the 11th pair of shoes, her dark eyes flash with anger, and I fear spanking. That is none of her damn business, she says. Who does she think she is? Before I can feel relief that she's not mad at me, Mama says, get your coat and let's go. I do as I'm told. Mama throws on her soft blue leather coat, the color of the periwinkle crayon in my Crayola box, and together we slide into her new Buick Riviera. Are we headed back to school to confront Ms. Miller? Thank God, no, as Mama heads south, away from Winterhalter Elementary. She soon turns onto Second Avenue. 
drives to the corner of Lothrop and parks in front of the new center building. There sits Saks Fifth Avenue. We enter through regal double doors and I instantly fall in love with the store's marble floors and brass elevators and bright chandeliers. I feel lucky just being here. Mama takes my hand and leads me to the children's shoe department where an array of options spreads before us. She points to a pair of yellow patent leather shoes. Those are pretty, she says. Perhaps the saleswoman looks at us askance, given how rare it must have been to see black people inside Detroit's upscale shops in the 60s, but I don't remember. What I do remember is how nonchalantly Mama opens her wallet, pulls out a $100 bill, and pays for the shoes, while the saleswoman looks at her the way Miss Miller looked at me. When we get home, Mama says, you're going to wear these to school tomorrow, and you better tell that damn teacher of yours that you actually have a dozen pairs of shoes, you hear me? The next day, I wear my brand new shoes with a matching yellow knit dress, nervous. As I walk up to my teacher's desk, I announce, Miss Miller, I have 12 pairs of shoes. <laughs> she looks down at my feet and then levels those blue eyes at my face. Sit down. Miss Miller never says another word to me. I feel her rejection, but I am also relieved. I no longer have to worry about what I wear to school or feel bad about my nice things. I feel both protected and indulged by mama. Growing up, that's how it was for me and for my three older sisters and my brother. We lived well, thanks to mama and her numbers, which inured us from judgment. My mother's message to black and white folks alike was clear. It's nobody's business what I do for my children, nor how I manage to do it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, that was fabulous. Um, Hunter, would you like to come up next? Hello, everybody. Um, those were so amazing. <laughs> I feel uh, so flattered to be up here with you too. Those were great. And Jeopardy? Really? Oh man. I can only think if that ever happened to me, how many people my mom would tell. Uh, it would make her day. Uh, so thank you to everybody who, who came out for this and who helped put this together. Uh, it's really exciting to be here and I'm excited to read from this ridiculous project of mine, which is... Uh, it is a, a book about all of the, the materials the human body sheds. And each chapter is a material uh, from mucus to tears to breath to what I'll be reading tonight, which is about vomit. Um, and it's kind of, you know, it, <laughs> memoir, social history, investigative journalism, all that kind of stuff. History, a little science tossed in there. Uh, and so, give you a little background on this. This is, this is a very, very, very long chapter I'm just going to read a little bit of. But my goal here was, uh, I, you know, in, in the book I try to kind of explore different modes of, of nonfiction. And this one I wanted to be as much gonzo journalism, journalism as possible. Uh, so I said, I'm going to do the most intense vomiting known to human beings. Um, and I decided to join a vomiting cult. Um, you, you probably have heard this stuff, ayahuasca. People talk about it like it's a normal thing, but you can only do it as part of a religion. Um, and so that means you basically have to join a cult to do it, which I didn't realize at the time. I thought I was just going to do this. Uh, but I learned, I learned. So uh, I'm just gonna get you right into it. And this chapter is called, I did the hardest thing in my life in a port john in Orlando. 
Uh, and I wrote that line in, in a portage on in Orlando. <laughs> on a spiritual map, Soul Quest Ayahuasca Church of Mother Earth, that's the name of my cult, sits firmly at the nexus of our world in several less burdened dimensions. But on this plane, it's located about 20 minutes east of downtown Orlando, on a long, skinny parcel of live oaks and bamboo between a martial arts academy and an auto body shop. The conventional way to arrive is by automobile, usually a lift from the airport, though occasionally people make the long haul down from Georgia or Alabama in their SUV and park behind the horse gate in the lot out back. Despite the church's lack of attachment to the usual terrestrial expectations, it is not a night, fly by night sort of affair. There's a tent in the back where Sean, a beefy medic with a silver buzz cut, takes temps and blood pressures. And someone in the organization knows their way around Microsoft Word. In the front office, there are printed name tags with the church logo and designations as the wearer's role and lodging details. I'm in Dragonfly Lodge. While the church does not charge for their holy medicine, a bitter psychedelic liquid made from the leaves of the ayahuasca vine, they do collect a donation for the two-day retreat, about $900, to cover, to cover the cost of accommodations, a four-inch mattress on the, on the floor, meals, inter intermittent celery, and the work of accompaniment and supervision. To facilitate the transfer of this lucre, the church is connected to the usual payment channels. They accept Visa and MasterCard, even if they occasionally mix up the files and inadvertently try to charge you for the extra ceremony on Saturday morning. I spent, spent some time in mid-September as a member of this church. Along with 85 or so other souls, I swiped my credit card, accepted the sacrament, and embarked on a journey. I have no doubt that some of my fellow travelers found a measure of relief in the arms of ayahuasca on the grounds of that church. I only know that my single strongest conviction as I crept out under the locked horse gate was that I would never, not in a million celestial lifetimes, set foot again on that property. I feel driven to account for that misguided weekend because I am someone who failed to transcend. My ego is not burned from my bones by the juice of the vine. I met no earthen goddesses. I vomited no endlessly coiled snake. I write this because I did not make it to the other side, and some did, and they're no longer around to give the accounting. Even now, hurtling north on the Amtrak Silver Meteor, separated from the retreat by little more than a handful of hours and 60 miles of steel, I cannot recall the exact shifting in my perspective that occurred over the course of the weekend, or how precisely I found myself, ant-bitten and half-conscious, being evacuated by stretcher from a grove of oaks out back of the compound. When did exactly did rain start to seize? Rain is one of my, my cohort. And was it before or after my hands grew two sizes? Someone made the decision to join that church, and someone writes these words now. But I'm unclear what precisely separates those two people. This uncertainty gives the process of composition a disconcerting and unhelmed quality. I can say only one thing with any certainty, and this I mention in the hope of su sufficiently inculpating myself in what turned out to be the single worst decision of my entire life. I can say only this, in retrospect, there were a great many hints. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump you ahead uh, so you can get a little flavor of the actual place. Uh, just to kind of the moments before this all happened. Uh, and you really don't need to know too much except uh, it was very scary. So. Around dusk, we all gathered in the courtyard. A hedge of bamboo swayed above us. A volunteer lit a fire in the fire pit, and they started waving bundles of smoking sage around our bodies. They spritzed our hands with Florida water and had us fill handfuls of rice with our intentions and throw them into some flames. Then they gave us each a little white cup with a, th a slosh of thick brown sludge inside. We'd all grown accustomed to the terminology by then. The phrases came to mind naturally. Staring down into these cups, we knew that we, what we were looking at was not a drug. This was the medicine. The medicine would deliver us to Mother Ayahuasca. Tonight we'd been told we would meet her. Tomorrow morning we would date her. It was presumed by this time that we'd all sign up for an additional ceremony. And tomorrow night the two of us would marry. It was not vomiting that would chaperone this courtship, it was purging. 
This was an important distinction we now understood for one thing because purging connotated a more spiritual experience than vomiting. More pressingly though, we'd learned little by little over the course of the afternoon it was called purging because many people did not actually vomit at all. Instead, they had explosive diarrhea. We have a saying in this business, the head of the cult said, his last word of advice before releasing us to the ceremony, never fart. The manifesto says, those who most need Mother Ayahuasca shall find her by, the, by their vibratory, <laughs> vibratory attunement. The manifesto, by the way, is their uh, scriptural PDF. Uh, <laughs> and as we all milled about the court, courtyard, staring down from time to time into the viscous liquid in our cups, there was a certain kind of a universal vibration that would perhaps be, better be described as collective agitation. Those who had been calm were now nervous. Those who had been gregarious became quiet. One of the young men had ceased to see other people entirely. One woman passed through the crowd like a ghost in Shakespeare. Another stood alone, looking lonely. I went to her. We talked. I don't remember what we said. I moved on. The dominant motif was turmoil. We milled. And there was reason to be concerned. While tryptamines, the main drug in ayahuasca, are generally pretty safe, there's no real guarantee that you'll be safe while you're on them. There was the volunteer who had told me in passing that a spaceship had tried to abduct her during her last uh, time at the, at the compound. Just sh surrender, she recommended. Otherwise, you'll only prolong your suffering. There were also the cases of psychedelic catastrophe that I'd read about before coming. It's part of my research. The 26-year-old man who was seen to walk in front of a heavy goods vehicle while grinning or the two men in their 20s who each ingest, ingested several seeds of Hawaiian baby woodrose. One experienced a sense of well-being as well as losing track of time. The other jumped out the window, falling several stories and suffering conquestation of the skull, multiple rib and pelvic fractures, lacerations of the right lung, cardiac contusion, hemopericardium, bilateral hemothorax, total rupture of the th thoracic aorta, subarachnoidal hemorrhage, and arth arthrosclerosis of the aorta and coronary arteries, death, in other words. A person was careful not to think about these things at this moment, with this cup in their hand. But still, they were there in the mind. You knew it. Somewhere out there, that spaceship hovered. More worrisome than one's well-being, though, was the thought of one's well-being afterwards. With any psychedelic, you're talking about the possibility of fundamentally altering the way your mind works, even for a person who's done their fair share of drugs. Every trip is a sobering leap into the unknown. And ayahuasca, in many ways, is the psychedelic of all psychedelics. It's not th the sort of thing where Jerry Gar Garcia smiles up at you out of the carpet. It makes people violently ill. There's a lot of talk of snakes and pain and surrender. Any person getting handed the cup, as I was, is bound to think very hard about what they've gotten themselves into. There's always the chance with psychedelics, the guy next to me said that you can get rid of something that really turned out to be totally necessary to the function of your organism. <laughs> this guy I know had a bad acid trip. He didn't realize there were socks balled up in, his, in the front of his shoes and he broke all his toes. Wasn't anyone with him when he was tripping, I said? No, no, the man turned his palms up in clarification. This was 20 years later. <laughs> what was I doing with my life? Cups in hand, we returned to our various lodges and our mattresses. And as the moment drew near when we would actually imbibe the liquid, these misgivings all manifested in a mild but pervading mania. The mattresses were set out in row, two rows at intervals down the length of the lodge. Hardly more than 18 inches separated, me, separated one from the next. And in this confined space, each person suddenly set to arranging and rearranging the few belongings they brought along. They put their shoes at the foot of the mattress, moved their notebook from the left side to the right side and back again. They zipped their duffels, fluffed their pillows, folded their blankets, closed their eyes and breathed deeply, then sat back up and checked to make sure their phones were off. We'd been told the story of the panicked participant who got on her phone and dialed 911. My personal quandary was my name tag, which was clipped uncomfortably to the neck of my sweatshirt. I was troubled by the image of the tag swinging down into my line of puke as I expelled my morning's Amtrak oatmeal. 
but in a more faux philosophical way, I just couldn't wrap my mind around the idea of wearing a name tag on a psychedelic trip. Skeptical as I was of the idea of meeting Earth and spirits, I didn't want to show up dressed like I was headed for the Javits. I took it off and placed it on the floor beside me, but no sooner was it gone than I started to argue from the other perspective. What if I really did lose my mind? It occurred to me there's probably a real reason each name tag had the name of the church in our specific place of lodging written on it. Which lodge was I in anyway? Hummingbird? Dragonfly? I saw myself feet bare, pupils big as gumdrops, wandering the glass-strewn shoulder of some wide Floridian highway, grabbing the cashier at Dunkin' Donuts and demanding to know what was really in the eclairs. And they'd say, if only he'd been wearing his name tag. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that was vivid and exciting work. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you to all three of you. It's just wonderful to have your words here in the room.